Hello everyone and welcome to Saturn Returns with me, Kagi Dunlop. This is a podcast that aims to bring clarity during transitional times where there can be confusion and doubt. Today I'm joined by someone who I've been following for a while. I'm a huge fan of his work. So I was very pleased when he agreed to come onto the show and he had just arrived off the plane from Ireland and that is the wonderful Pat DeVille. I've been listening to Pat's podcast and reading into his work. I think it's so, so important what he's doing. In this conversation, we discuss a lot of stuff. We unpack his journey to where he is now, his struggles with school and bullying, and kind of this idea that no matter where we get to or how the world perceives us in our adult self, there's always a part of us that feels like that little child that sort of vulnerability and whatever pain or experiences or wounding we have from that childhood experience, we carry with us and how those wounds play out in our lives. I think simply having the awareness over this sort of thing is the first step and being able to have these conversations and allow people to recognize that it's very human and it's very normal and the work required to heal from it isn't easy but I you know, applaud any of you who are going through it and I think simply by listening to this podcast shows that you are willing and ready to go there. We delve into nervous system work which is something that I have been working on you know personally for a while as well and I think it's such an important key ingredient that kind of ties this whole thing together. Pat is also a big fan of internal family systems therapy, which we've had a number of podcasts about, but the way he explains it is hugely informative. And another thing that I wasn't expecting to talk about, but I'm so glad that we did, was male archetypes. When I was researching Pat's work, I came across it and it really fascinated me because to be honest, I've done so much around female archetypes. I hadn't really paid much attention to what the male archetypes were. In fact, I didn't know until I read Pat's work. And so actually recognizing, I think it's super important to recognize like the the man's journey, the sort of masculine, like this audience is very female heavy. And I think it's really important to bring men into these conversations and to platform them and to celebrate them because it's hard women tend to talk a lot more about stuff a bit more openly and so for men to do it it takes a lot of courage and so I really you know support Pat in everything that he's doing so I'll stop rambling on but I love this conversation everyone from the team was super impressed and fascinated by Pat and the way he spoke so I know you guys are gonna love it enjoy Hello, Pat. Hello, Keggy. Hello, London. <laughs> Hello, London. <laughs> You've literally just come straight from the airport, haven't you? Yeah, pretty much. How are you feeling? I'm grounding. I'm not grounded. I'm grounding. Right. Are you feeling ungrounded because you've just flown in or generally? Oh, yeah, just because I've flown in. Yeah. General life check-in. I'm, I'm in a good place. Good. And how do you find coming into London? Because you, you said just before we started recording, you're from quite a small town. Yeah, well, I'm Galway and west coast of Ireland, famous for the Ed Sheeran song. Oh, yeah. And that's like a slow pace of life, for me at least. Live by the beach, train jiu-jitsu, do some work, go for a sea swim. So London's hectic for me. I do oh. like it. It's nice to come for a couple of days and get the energy. Yeah, and but, then leave. And then leave. <laughs> London's hectic for me, and I've it's been my home my whole life. But anyway, for those that don't know, would mm. you be able to explain a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. I am, so I'm 35 now, which means I'm 15 years in the wellness industry. Um, I lived in England for a year when I was 20, did a master's in exercise and nutrition science. And the fitness industry back then wasn't really a thing. This was like 2009. So the fitness industry hadn't really taken off at that point. But fitness for me was the first thing in my life that ever gave me confidence. And I'd always struggled with confidence and being bullied. I had a lot of insecurity as a young man. And having found some confidence in fitness, I said, this is going to be my career. And so I did the master's here. I went back to Dublin. So I went from my small town of Galway to Dublin. And I had these notions that I was going to be a success story and everyone back home was going to see how special I was. It was all driven by insecurity. 
So I went to Dublin, I worked in a gym, I got fired from that gym pretty quickly because I would tell the clients, this doesn't really work, you need to, you know, do things differently. And I went out on my own at 22 in Dublin and I was kind of mad ambition, I'm going to be successful, I'm going to show everyone. And looking back, I realized nobody cared what I was doing, but I had all this kind of um, young ego. And I struggled for two years trying to get the business off the ground, um, but didn't want to come home with my tail between my legs. Mm-hmm. And eventually I came home at 24 and I've told the story a thousand times, but I came back home on a bus on Christmas Eve, borrowed money from my dad to get home. My mum's birthday was Christmas Day. I couldn't afford a gift. And for the next six months, I just went into like deep shame uh, with having failed, having to move back home, um, not being able to buy my mum a birthday present on, on Christmas Day. And I was lost for six months of my life at 24. And I look back now and I'm like, you're a 24. 24. <laughs> Everyone's lost at 24. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. And you had all this pressure that. Huge pressure. That you I put thought it was from the outside, but it was actually sort of internalized yeah. that you were putting on yourself. 100%. And so I worked in a pizza shop for six months. And part of the pressure came from the fact when I was in Dublin, I used to train all the models and I would oh. train them for free. Early influencer marketing, I'd say, I'm going to train you for free. Put me in the newspapers. I'll be a celebrity trainer. And so my friends see me training models and never coming home and they're saying he's made it, he's yeah. successful. And then six months later, I'm in the pizza shop and they're like, what's happened? So anyway, um, really dark six months, really dark. And um, eventually my dad kind of gave me some tough love and he said half your problem and half of your struggles are the fact that you're obsessed with your own problems and struggles. And if you went out there and you help people in some capacity, you'd pretty quickly get past what you're experiencing. And my mentality was, I can't help myself. I can't get out of bed. Never mind, help anyone else. Were you in a real sort of state Yeah, of I was lost. Yeah, day. yeah, I was, yeah. I was uh, the darkest of days. And some of the nights in Dublin, there was a night in Dublin where I went down to the docks in the middle of the night and, and thought I was going to end it all. And um, yeah, it's, it, it feels like a different life in a way. You know, yeah. it's hard to connect to that now, but... But anyway, I took my dad's advice and I started offering free training plans online. And 12 weeks after offering my first plan, a guy emailed me and he said, this is my results. He said, I don't know if it's any use to you, but if you want to share the pictures, maybe it'll get you some clients. And so I shared the pictures and I said, I'm going to start fitness classes on the local beach because I didn't have to pay rent. So it was a free way of training people. And five people showed up for my first class and it completely changed my life. So that was like 2012 because I was so low and I felt like nothing. And these five people believing in me sort of gave me a, a touch of, I can believe in myself again. And of hope. Yeah, yeah, hope and possibility. Um, and so I invested, you know, I, I think at that point I realized I was still young and egotistical. I probably still am egotistical at least. But, you know, at 20, 21, I thought fitness was broccoli and sit-ups and push-ups and chicken breasts. And that was what fitness was. And having gone through my struggles and I recognized fitness was like a vehicle for community and change and all these other, other things. So I started with these five clients. I said, I'm going to be the best part of these people's day. And within three months, there was a hundred people coming to the beach. And within wow. a year, it had all turned around. I had opened a gym. I, I had um, brought out my first book. And within five years- well, within a year, you did the book. It was crazy. It just, yeah. So that, that moment having those five people, was mm. that just- completely shifted everything. Yeah, and I tell people that now, I think there's such a tendency to want to go from A to Z. And like totally. half of our stress in life is this disconnect. All of our stress in life is a disconnect. I've got a picture in my head of where I should be. And then mm. I've got reality. Well, our expectations versus reality. Exactly. It's like, that is what sets us up for disappointment a lot of the time. Exactly. Was it what your father said to you that really, you know, changed your perspective on things? That kind of shift from, and we all do it kind of being in service of our egos or wanting to attain certain things for, you know, wanting to achieve stuff so we feel better or like we can be validated by those we know versus it being about service to others. How can I support other communities and people around me? Was that a moment that really changed things? Yeah, I think a lot of this stuff, I look back and I can kind of make sense of it now. At the time, I was just going along with, you know, I think I reached a point of desperation where I said my way doesn't work. So I need to start listening to other people. So my dad definitely supported me in that way with a bit of tough love. 
there was a guy in the UK. I used to follow all the famous trainers in the UK and mm -hmm. I messaged them all and I said, can you give me some advice? Like, I need to be able to do this. If you can do it, I can do it. And one guy got back, got back to me and he said, I'm going to give you a call. And I was so broke at the time. I said, this guy's rich. He's ringing me from England to Ireland. Like this guy's made it. And he called me for 10 minutes and he just gave me a bit of encouragement. And it wasn't anything I didn't know. It was just, you can do this. And that was another conversation. And it was these little things. And I guess you can have kind of downward spirals where one thing leads into the next, into the next. And you can also have the upward spiral. So like one positive experience creates a new story and the new story creates a new feeling and suddenly it's gone up the way. And also having the courage to make those steps when you are feeling the lowest of the low to actually do that thing, which might be reaching out to someone and asking them for help or advice that then starts creating the upward spiral, which is the hardest thing to make mm. that first step, right? Yeah, there is that thing, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So I think sometimes you have to get pissed off enough at your situation. Yeah. And sometimes you have to get inspired enough by your situation. And then funnily in recent times, I've seen sometimes it's just times where it clicks and things just come together. So there's kind of people often talk about desperation and inspiration as being great drivers. But I also think timing as well. You probably know more about that from the astrological side, but um, to trust the timing, if you trust like. the timing. Yeah, yeah. I think things come when they're supposed to. Between 2012, 2016, a lot of my generation in Ireland had gone to Australia and America and Canada because the recession was pretty bad at home. And so people started messaging and saying, why is everyone on the beach with you? Like, can I do this online? And so I said, I'm going to put this online. And there was 20,000 clients between 2012, and 2016 that went through online training courses. So my business blew up and between 24 and 28, my life just looked externally completely different. It was like night and day, failure to success, bought a house, bought a car, met a great girlfriend, had it all. And at 28, I found myself going to psychi psychiatrists, psychologists, shamans, energy healers, every type of person because I was lost again. And it Talk was to me about feeling lost again, because on the exterior, you had mm. all the things you'd you were successful by mm. anyone's definition of it. Mm. But you still felt as lost as you did when you actually didn't have anything. Or was it a different kind of lostness? Yeah, the, I think there was two things in it. Like one was you can be driven by wounding or you can be driven by worth. So wounding is like, I'm a wounded person or I see myself as a wounded person. There's something missing in me. But if I achieve the thing, then I'll feel enough. So that's mm -hmm. me thinking that something outside of myself is going to fill a void within me. And that drove all of my behavior. I'm not enough. I don't fit in. I'm weird. I'm different. People don't see me. That was my driver. I was completely driven by fear. Worth is a sense of I'm going to go and do this thing because I can, and because I want to. So I think the energy from where I was coming was one thing. Um, the other thing was throughout my life, I had always had things I could point to for like struggles with mental health. So mm -hmm. I could point to the fact I was bullied. I could point to the fact that alcohol was a big part of my early twenties. I could point to the fact that uh, I had failed with a business. And this was the first, first time at 28 where I couldn't point to anything. I had it all. I had ticked every box I ever wanted. You know, I had the business I wanted, great people around me. And I went to a psychologist psychiatrist, oh, every, every ist under the sun, every shaman, energy healer, uh, again. And was that new, new territory for you? I was always quite open to all that stuff. Yeah. There were certain things now looking back where I'm like, oh, it makes a bit more sense. You know, mm -hmm. like some of the energy healers would have me doing uh, mantras, 108 mantras, you know, to remove obstacles, uh, chanting to Ganesh, all this kind of stuff that at the time I was like, I don't know what this is, but I'll do anything at this point. But I went to a psychologist and she shared this analogy and I always share it with people since. And she said that we have a fire alarm in our house and the purpose of the fire alarm in the house is that when there's danger, your fire alarm goes off and it says there's danger, get to safety. And she says sometimes the fire alarm breaks and you're using your toaster or the oven and the fire alarm's beeping and you're just like, oh, this is a pain in the ass. So there's a malfunctioning fire alarm. And she said, you've got a fire alarm within your system that's there to trigger anxiety or a stress response within the body when you're under threat or you're in danger. And she said, sometimes that fire alarm is being triggered when it's not supposed to be. And she said, that's what's going on for you. She said, you're getting triggered by every little situation and going into a fight or flight response. You're hyper vigilant. And that was kind of my experience at that time. It wasn't so much depressive at that time. It was more just anxiety. couldn't sleep, couldn't look people in the eye, couldn't switch off, couldn't slow down, couldn't enjoy the moment, uh, couldn't stop moving. I was like high functioning anxiety. I was mm -hmm. fine when I was going. 
but alcohol was the only thing really that could quiet my mind on and the weekends and slow me down. Yeah, yeah. And then that becomes a vicious cycle because it it said momentarily alleviates the anxiety, but charges you interest the next day. Yeah, I like that. Charges you interest, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> I paid off my interest. Um, yeah, it is that like the cycle of addiction is you know uncomfortable feeling. I'm going to reach for a temporary escape. There's consequences, and then there's shame, and then I'm in the shame, and then I go back to the addictive behavior, and this becomes the cycle. Yeah. So, and I think then being in the fitness industry at the time, there was also a bit of shame around the fact that I'm a fitness guy. I shouldn't be partying like this on the weekends. So right. there was a lot going on. And then the other piece, which will lead me on to, I suppose, what I'm doing now. The other piece was that I could point to all these things intellectually, the sh- reasons I should be happy. I've got a house, I've got a car, I've got a business. I, I should be happy. There was all these shoulds again, so expectations. Yeah. But the reality was my system, like my nervous system, my body was just not in a good place. And so I put it to people sometimes that if I've got kids and my child says to me, I'm scared, and my response is to say, don't be scared, don't be silly. There's this weird disconnect that happens for the child because they're experiencing sensations in their body. They're being told that it's not true. That's not, not true. Valid. Yeah. And then later in life, we do, do that to ourselves. So I'm experiencing yeah. anxiety, but I'm saying I shouldn't be anxious. I should be happy. I should be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so at that time, I just started reassessing everything and kind of changing direction. And again, it was this case of, I think at that point, it was time to look at the wounds. So like, what are these wounds that are driving me? Like my fear of not fitting in, my fear of judgment, all these things I'd run away from for so long. Mm-hmm. I had to go and address them. And so the last seven or eight years has been shadow work and inner child work and meditation and breath work and yeah. compassionate inquiry with Gabor. And um, So you really went fully into <laughs> yeah. this stuff from that point. Because you speak a lot about internal family system therapy and I can see a lot of references even in your language around it. Mm. Is that something that came into your sort of vocabulary and understanding when you were doing this therapy at that time? Uh, probably not seven or eight years ago, but I have a good friend, Josh, that lives over here in the UK. He's an amazing guy, Josh Connolly. He does great work. And we came across a book a couple of years ago called Self Therapy by Jay Early. And that was IFS, so Internal Family Systems, but it had practical exercises. And myself and Josh had our little boys club and we meet on Zoom every Monday for two hours and do therapy on each other. I love that. It was amazing. It was like, that book is great, actually, for, for starting to dissect the different parts. And I had a conversation with Dick Schwartz a couple of years ago. And, you know, even the language in internal family systems, for anyone who's not familiar, it's just that idea that we're composed of all these different parts. And one part of me is motivated, another part's scared. And sometimes I say I want something, but I do the opposite. And the parts work helps us to understand, like, why is there this carnage and chaos in my mind? Mm-hmm. Why am I driven in some ways? And um, yeah, that's been really helpful for me. Uh, it's been really useful. And I do a lot of men's work now and, and the parts work is supportive in men's work as well, because it helps us understand the different aspects of the psyche. I think it's a powerful modality, uh, mm-hmm. the IFS stuff, yeah. And you spoke, in, you spoke a second ago about you know our wounding and how that's often can be our driving force towards things. Mm. Um, I definitely know from my own experience personally and also what I witnessed mainly in my time when I was living in LA, which just epitomizes the perfect facade. You know, Mm. everyone had so much and everyone seemed to be living these great lives, but a lot of them were very deeply unhappy because I think without realizing it, we are often driven by fear more than worse. You know, that thing of feeling like at school we weren't enough or if we were bullied or anything like that. And no matter what we become, what version of ourselves we present to the world, internally, there is still that feeling of of lack, of that wounding. So mm-hmm. what did you kind of discover from your own personal wounds and how did you shift that? So much, I, I think, I think the ultimate one is, you know, they often talk about the first seven years of our life will shape a huge amount of our conditioning. Mm-hmm. So at that point, we're largely emotional beings. We don't have a lot of language. We don't have a lot of um, perspective. We don't have context. And so we're quite black and white in our thinking. So if I get bullied, I'll give that a, a you know, a, a meaning. I don't fit in. It's very black and white. It's not, oh, well, maybe that person's going through struggles and maybe they've got challenges. Yeah. It's, it's black and white. I don't fit in. Uh, if people laugh at me in school, okay, I'm either the funny guy or I'm the funny looking guy. I'm going to come up with a, a label around that. 
And so we start shaping our worldview in those first couple of years. And I was just running actually a shadow work workshop this past weekend and talking about how you can think about your family structure as being the first set of filters. So what my parents and my siblings think of how the world should look, that's going to influence how I show up in the world. Um, there's aspects that will be celebrated within me and there's aspects that will be judged and shamed within me. And so I quickly learned this is good, this is bad, put this in the good box, put this in the bad box and keep that hidden away for the rest of your life. And what were those things? Uh, I think the same things there for a lot of people. Uh, emotion was one that I was told not to really express. Be too emotional, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, and I was highly sensitive. You know, I was sensitive. My emotions were close to the surface myself. I'd be able to stand in a group and know what was going on for different people. Um, it's become my superpower, like a lot of these things that we hide. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, it was definitely boys don't cry, you know, uh, just get on with it, keep the head down, all that kind of stuff. But we get shaped, I think, in those first couple of years by our family and then the school structure, there's more rules and filters added and then culturally through religion, through media, through all these different things. So there's an author back in the day called Robert Bly. He's an inc uh, incredible guy. And he would talk about how the first 21 years of our life were sort of um, hiding all these different parts of ourselves. And then the rest of your life's work is about bringing those parts back out into the light you know what's so interesting about that because obviously the podcast Saturn Returns I don't know how much you mentioned astrology before we started recording mm. but basically your Saturn return happens in your late 20s mm. so around 29 but we also have Saturn squares and oppositions so 7 14 21 are these like initiations ah, yes. in astrology from Saturn and if you actually think about it and reflect on your life they are such pivotal milestones where we get sort of confronted with themes of authority, responsibility. So you saying that makes a lot of sense in the context of, you know, the mm. brand and Saturn Returns, because I definitely feel, for me personally anyway, up until 21, I was trying to fit in and then felt very lost throughout a lot of my 20s whilst I was trying to reclaim or discover my authenticity. Mm. So is that kind of a journey that feels similar to you? Yeah, for sure. You know, we, we have this battle between will I be myself or will I fit in? Well, it's the Gabal Mate thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's for sure. Versus belonging. Yes, yes. And we will abandon our authenticity in order to feel like we belong, sometimes in the wrong places. Yeah, and the more we do it, I suppose, the more we kind of abandon our true self, if you will, or the further we become disconnected, we can wake up. That's what the midlife crisis is in some ways. You've like hidden all these parts of yourself and you've put yourself in this tiny little box. And you wake up and you say, is this, this, this can't be it. Like, is this all there is? And so Carl Jung would talk about that same idea. First half of your life is kind of like coming into the material world and like getting a job and maybe finding a partner and doing all these things. Second half life is about the spiritual side and really discovering who you are beyond, I suppose, the, the conditioning. Which again, I think normalizes for a lot of people that are going through that transition to make it feel like it's more of a universal thing. Because I think as you know, when you are going through that, it can feel very isolating and very confusing because you have this sense that everyone else has has it all figured out mm. and you're the only one that doesn't. Mm. Whereas I'm sure it's been your experience through your work that most people feel very similar. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think life is about these initiations, like these calls of, you know, Joseph Campbell talk about the hero adventure, the, the you know, the, the hero's journey and the, the call to adventure and, in school, we start school together with our friends and then we graduate and we go to secondary school or high school with our friends and then we go to college or we go to work. And there's these kind of initiations early on in life that everyone around you is doing it. So At it's the like same time, a bit yeah. easier. But then you're older and you're like, OK, maybe I'm not happy in my relationship, but you have to do that initiation on your own. But I like the idea that every initiation brings you a bit closer to soul. Mm -hmm. to your like truth um, but you got to go through those and that's a big part of initiation is going back into the wound so again whatever the wound is but I want to circle back around you you asked about um uh how did how do you start to recognize the the wound or, or do the work on the wound I think those first seven years recognizing what were the core messages that you took on and then looking at the years since, how have those messages played out? So if one of my core messages in those first seven years was I don't fit in, how has I don't fit in played out in the chapters since? So there's lots of different external uh, situations and experiences, but the, the narrative will be similar because it's almost like putting on a pair of sunglasses and everything now looks darker. Uh, 
it's not that everything out there has changed, just my way of seeing the world has changed. And that's what our stories do to us. That's what those early uh, conditioning. Can you give me an example of where that narrative, perhaps Mm. a personal one for you, played out later on in life? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll give an exercise with it, actually, if if, if that's okay. Of course. Exercise called the, the chapters of life. And the chapters of life is you would divide your age by about six. Your first chapter is the early years in your life. The sixth chapter will be the most recent years in your life. And the other chapters will be everything in between. So I'm 35. Let's say I'm 36. (laughs) Uh, Divide by six. So first six years of my life will be chapter one. Next six years will be chapter two. And basically for each chapter, I'll just look at what title, without thinking too much, I don't want to like be trying to get this right. I always tell people with like inner work, don't be a researcher that's trying to get it right. Be an explorer who's trying to get curious. So without thinking too much, what chapter title would I give to the first six years of my life? And what couple of sentences could I use to give the plot? And I keep it really simple. Who were the main characters? What was the plot? What was the chapter title? You could have two children that had very similar experiences. They came up with very different interpretations. An example sometimes given is two kids that grow up with alcoholic parents. One becomes an alcoholic because he says, well, that's all I ever saw. The other never drinks in his life because he says, that's all I ever saw. So our interpretations are everything. So look at chapter one, chapter one title, comfortable at home. The plot is really happy at home. Everything's going well. The main characters are my parents and my siblings. And then it moves to chapter two and chapter three and chapter four. And when you do this exercise, oftentimes what you'll find out is the earlier chapters will really often inform the later chapters. And so we're living in cycles. Our environments change, our situations change, our relationships change, but oftentimes the core narratives are the same. And the invitation once you've done the six chapters is to consciously choose, because the idea is we've been unconsciously living out cycles, but with awareness, we've got choice and awareness can bring change. So I have a choice now, what's my next chapter gonna be called? So I recognize that early on, a belief I took on was that I don't fit in and I'm not enough. And I played that out time and time again. And so there was external success. There was external changes. There was lots that happened in my life, but that story was always below the surface. And so when I looked at chapter seven, my next chapter, I said, I don't care about external success as much as I care about rewriting my my life script. Because that's what it is, is your life script. It's the movie script of your life. And I said, chapter seven is going to be about connection, about leaning in, about being brave, about having courage. And the plot is, he changed everything, or you know, and, and, and who are the characters? I find that a powerful exercise. It shows you your patterns and it gives you choice. And those two things, those two things alone, figure out your patterns and give yourself a choice. I love that. I think that's such a useful exercise for people and the chapters of our life. When, when you say that, definitely for me, my personal experience, I, I can I'm automatically kind of figuring out, okay, that chapter was that, that chapter was that. And do you think, cause you know how they often say that zero to seven are the, like very formative and they kind of set us up in our behavior and how we're gonna view the world and everything. Mm. But would it not be valid to say that it's actually the chapters that had the most amount that happened in? Do you know what I mean? As in like zero to seven, if you just were playing games with your siblings and mom and dad were there and whatever, that perhaps wasn't as huge as seven to 12 where Mm. you got bullied Mm. and you had these humongous lessons and experienced a huge amount of pain that then set you up for the next chapter that meant that you were then going to wear a mask. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, sure. As in it's rather than it just being zero to seven, it's like, where was the time? Like, mm. And I think like for those listening, we all have something that we go to mm. that was a moment in time, in our history, in our childhood, whatever it might be, that for whatever reason was really formative in our decision-making. Mm. And often when we are in heightened situations in life, whether that's in relationship, which can often bring up Mm. all of that stuff to the surface, we feel that way again, you know? And you said for you that, and if you're happy to talk about it, that school and having that experience being bullied, does that, is that still something you have to manage and confront that plays out in certain scenarios in your life today? Yeah, for sure. You know, the, the concept of inner child work, we hear a lot about inner child work and 
you know, I think with any type of healing work, it can be nice to think about getting it done. Like ambition is the enemy kind of thing where I'm going to achieve this. Like uh, that, that was my approach when I came to this work was, oh, well, I'm going to like take it off the list. Yeah, and... I need to get this done. Like I don't have time to be spending too long on this. But the reality of inner child work and working with these different parts is it's a relationship. Like you're having an ongoing relationship with a part of yourself. And so if you think about a time where your inner child, which is your younger self, got overwhelmed, the way I think about it is it's like that part of you frozen time. Yeah. And now when you're experiencing similar situations, that part feels activated. And I often ask the question, who's showing up? And who's showing up is the question of, is it 35 year old Pat that shows up to do the podcast? Or is it five year old Pat who's like overwhelmed by his experience or whatever it is? And if it's the five year old, I take a step outside and take a few deep breaths and be with that part of myself. And it's an ongoing relationship. And you'll have many of those different parts in different situations. But that's what, you know, people talk about trauma a lot. You know, it's become a bigger and bigger word over the last couple of years. I think trauma is when the experience is too much to integrate and process and understand emotionally in the moment. So again, that part freezes, we have a freeze response, and there's an opportunity potentially to come back to it in time when we're resourced. You know, trauma happens when we're not resourced. We don't have the capacity to handle what's there. But maybe if we create the space later in life, we can do. I always tell people, don't go and do your inner child healing or your shadow work when you're moving house or you've got craziness going on in your life because you need to be resourced in order to heal. Grounded. Yeah. Yeah, you need those anchors, I suppose. Um, one of my mentors talks about emotion almost, almost being like the banks of the river and it's like crazy flow of the river and you need to build the banks, which is your resources. You need to have time in nature. You need to have people you can turn to. You need to have your therapist or whatever it is if you're going to go into the the fast flowing um, pace of those old emotions and those old stories. Which so, is also why a lot of people seem to feel that when thing they're in a healthy relationship or work going well, that suddenly mm. stuff comes to the surface that's yeah. very historical and they think, why, why is this coming up now? Yeah. But I guess that's just, you know, the body's way of saying, we feel ready to release this, to integrate it because it feels supported enough for it to, you know, come to the surface. Yeah, I have a belief that the psyche is not gonna give you anything you're not ready to handle. Yeah. And you've probably seen it. Have you seen the, the video of the polar bear, the uh, dislodging trauma? Have you seen that video? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just go down the YouTube rabbit hole and presume everyone's watched. So within the, this, this, I think this is a useful piece in general. It kind of comes back to the fire alarm piece that I talked about earlier, where cognitively you can look at your life and say, I shouldn't be stressed. But there's stuff going on in your body. There's, there's responses going on in your body that can leave your system feeling like it's stressed. So in the animal kingdom, an animal, animal will be relaxed and chilled out and they can hang out with their animal family and everything's good. But if a threat comes into their environment, they'll have a physiological response to keep them safe. Uh, the first response will be fight. So if I'm bigger than you, I'm probably going to fight you. That's my, my safety strategy. If you're bigger than me, I'm going to run away. Uh, if you're so much bigger than me that I don't have a hope in hell, I'm going to fall over and play freeze. dead and freeze or fawn and um, and you know, appease you or keep you happy or whatever it might be. Um, what you'll see with the, the, there's an amazing video of a polar bear and there's a helicopter with uh, researchers on it and they've got a tranquilizer gun and they're tracking this polar bear to check for different things they're measuring. And so the polar bear sees the helicopter, has the fight or flight energy and starts running and running and running. So it's a, it's a protective strategy. The fire alarm has gone off. But once the polar bear gets to safety and he starts coming through, you know, back uh, out of the paralyzed state or the tranquilized state, he starts quivering and shaking. Yeah. And it's kind of mad to see. And you're like, what's going on there? And it's him dislodging stress. Yeah. It's the body having a chance to complete the arousal cycle. So for many of us, we have stressful situations. And there's a big response in the body. My boss shouts at me, for example, I feel this big surge of energy, but I freeze because I can't run or fight my boss. But you don't shake it out. I just, it just sits there in my body. And now yeah. suddenly I go back into the world. We see this a lot with soldiers, right? That have been in a hypervigilant state for months or years and then try to come home and be domestic, you know, and try to be caring and compassionate and loving with their family. It just like doesn't serve, you, you, you can't, I think this is the big piece that we're moving into now in the coming years is like learning to be with the, the nervous system and to give yeah. ourselves what we need. Um, Don, do you know Donna Lancaster? 
I think you spoke to her recently, did I you? I did, yeah. <laughs> and she, she does a lot of sort of somatic work and she was saying, you know, a similar thing about animals and how they, they shake and they'll have those responses. And it was fascinating because I'd never really thought about it before, mm. but it goes to show that we do store all of that stuff in mm. our systems and nervous system work is it's becoming more and more in our vocabulary but it's still quite untapped to the masses but mm. such a key piece to our overall well-being mm. we see it um you know if you're nervous before a talk you'll see your hand is shaking this is yeah. your body letting go it's all neurogenic tremors so it's it's something that's natural but it gets socialized out of us there's an amazing doctor david berselli he came up with trauma release exercises and he talked about he was sat in a um, a war bunker he was working in war torn regions and he was sat in a bunker with bombs going off in the background and he had two toddlers on his lap and the toddlers every time a bomb would go off they'd shake so they would quickly dislodge the stress because they're in the safety of his arms so there's a sense of regulation and co-regulation through and they would naturally do that they'd naturally shake and then he looked around the room and he said once they get to five or six or seven suddenly they stop doing it because they're socialized to you know in all the ways we're socialized it's funny you talked about the seven year cycle one of the ways i think about the seven year cycle is the first seven years years of our life is very much about emotion like everything's experienced as emotion i can show all of my emotions everything's welcome hopefully to a certain degree the second seven years when i go to school everything becomes intellectual i'm tested on my intellect then I come into puberty, so everything comes about physicality, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then in theory, we might come into more of a spiritual realm as we get a bit older and hopefully as adults, the spiritual piece is to find a bit of my purpose and to turn my purpose or turn my passion into a purpose. So like my passion is what I love and what I'm willing to suffer for. And then my purpose is taking what I love and bringing it out into the world and contributing to the, the bigger um, system. It doesn't always work like that. A lot of people, message and i think purpose has become such a big word at the moment and more than now more than ever people want to do something that aligns with their purpose and obviously you have managed to create a career that is very much in alignment with your purpose but what would your advice be for people that perhaps are doing something that just doesn't feel right for them or they aren't really doing their true calling it's a couple of things i think the main thing is um I think one of the ways we trap ourselves in a lot of things is putting things in boxes. So mm -hmm. saying, I'll be happy when, and putting that in the box and putting happiness in the future, saying, I'll be confident when, or I'll feel successful when. And purpose kind of is the same. There's this idea that someday I'm going to stumble upon my purpose. Yeah. I think the secret, if there's a secret, like I'm really grateful to get to do what I do today. I, I work with men's groups in particular. So helping men to facilitate healthy conversations and safe spaces where they can let go. I do a lot of corporate work in healing stuff, which is something I never, I did lots of things I get to do that I never, never planned, never thought I'd end up doing whatever. But how it came about was started teaching fitness classes and then took the fitness classes online and then did, became a coach. And it was step by step by step. And every, not every step of the way, but a lot of the time I felt like, oh, I found my purpose now. And then it would go a, a layer deeper, like mm -hmm. layers of the onion. So I think the advice would be to just lean in and take the first step. I think there's a whisper in all of us. It kind of gets drowned out by the noise because there's so much external noise in our lives. If you can start creating a little bit of space through journaling or meditation and just start listening to that whisper, we talk about confidence, talk about purpose, talk about all these things. All of all of this trust in ourself comes from listening to the deeper part of yourself and then acting on what that part of you tells you to do. And then you come back and you do it again, you do it again and you do it again and suddenly everything's very different and it doesn't need to be a big grandiose leap you know mm -hmm. sometimes people think i need to leave my corporate job i need to I get emails every day from people i'm a doctor and i want to become a coach i'm like no don't don't do that um it's you know lean in start a nighttime course you know start reading a few books you just take consistent action in the direction of what feels right and and but really, I think letting go of the grandiosity of, you know, purpose being this thing that you're going to find, I don't know. That makes a lot of sense. And for you, when you started leaning into this work, mm. was there a lot of fear or expectation in terms of, you know, it's, I don't know what it's like as a man to kind of go into this stuff, but I know that the conversations are probably more common for women mm. because we do just tend to create these spaces where we'll open up about all this kind of stuff and that is very second nature for us whereas 
I know for men, it's still a little bit tricky and they don't know how to have these conversations or they haven't been socialized to do it. So mm. what has that been like? And for you personally, in terms of like your family dynamic and everything like that, how was it stepping into this space? It's been a, it's been an interesting few years. I, like I went through so many certifications and trainings where I was the only man on the training. Wow. And go, you had to go through a year long therapy training and again, be the only man for a year in, in the course and stuff. But again, this this idea of the hero's journey that I mentioned earlier, which is we feel a call to shift something in our life and to change something. And so we step away from the ordinary and we get mentors and we meet challenges. And the last part of the hero journey, which you can't forget, is you come back to your ordinary world and you bring back the gold that you got on the quest. So for me to have done all these courses over the years where I was the least experienced, I was the least emotionally aware, I was the least, you know, all this kind of stuff, the final chapter for me in that is to come back and like share that in a practical way with men that otherwise wouldn't get it mm -hmm. so um, powerful yeah it's fulfilling you know it's it's i think that's where your life purpose comes from i think your purpose comes from sharing your gifts uh, and your gifts come from your wounds so it's kind of this cyclical thing go into the wound learn and grow and heal and then come back and help the people that are coming with you um but I find men are, you know, men are ready to talk. They just need to feel safe in the space. And so there's different ways you do that. You know, you just, um, it was funny for me, I, you know, coming from the fitness space, I moved from that into more coaching and personal development for a few years and kind of traditional goal setting and time management and all those kind of things that were a bit more heady. And then it went more into emotional work and more soul work. But at first it was all women coming to my seminars because most of my fitness clientele were women. And there'd be a few men in the room and I'd say, I'm sorry, you were dragged along, lads. And they'd say, we were dragged along. And then eventually over the years, the dynamic started shifting where half the room would be men. And I said, okay, I need to start doing, you know, men specifically. Um, so it's, again, wasn't a plan. It was kind of just- It happened naturally. Yeah, yeah. Just, I think just keep showing up and be brave, I think is important in your life and start creating the spaces that you want to go to. You know, sometimes we're waiting for the perfect space. We're waiting for the perfect community. We're waiting for all these things to show up in our lives. And my experience has been oftentimes you have to build it yourself. You have to build the community. You have to build the tribe. You have to build the village. You have to build the culture. There's a lot of disease in the, like in, in the bigger culture. Um, one of my mentors says that uh, if you put an animal in the zoo, the animal gets sick. And it's not because there's anything wrong with the animal, it's the environment is a sick environment, so the animal's gonna get sick. And in many ways, the way that we live can be a bit like the zoo. A bit toxic. Yeah, and so we have mental health issues and we think there's something wrong with, with us. us. Maybe it's not yeah. us, maybe it's the System. environment. Mm. What, if there is one or any, of the main sort of things you feel from your experience and the work that you do, what are the things that men are struggling with at the moment? I mean, I always think it comes back to the I'm not enough story. I think that's yeah. there in some capacity. I'm not enough. I won't ever be enough. That's the big piece. There's four primary wounds. The way the way I, I work with men, one of the tools that I use with men, at least, is the idea of the male archetypes. This is what I wanted to talk <laughs> to you about. Talk about this? Yeah, okay. I'm so glad that you mentioned it because I, you know, the work that I do and the people that I've had on the show, there's a lot around female archetypes mm. and it's, it's work that I try and embody and, I find super interesting, but I have never had anyone come on and talk oh, about cool. male archetypes. So I would love you to dis uh, for us to discuss that for a minute. Nice, yeah. Um, there was a book written back in 1990 by two Jungian analysts, and they broke down these kind of four primary male archetypes. And for me, it provides a lovely map of the male psyche and a way of understanding our core wounds, our shadowy behaviors, and what mature masculinity could look like. So the idea is these archetypes, again, almost like parts or energies that live within us. And they're always there. They're just being played out in conscious or unconscious ways. So we talk about king, warrior, magician, and lover. Those are the four, king, warrior, magician, lover. The king in your life is the part of you that has vision and purpose and has a sense of what your kingdom looks like. So that's a sense of clarity, a sense of vision, a sense of purpose, a sense of I am enough. So that's a healthy king. And when you're in your healthy king, you experience joy. So it's not temporary happiness that might come from eating an ice cream. It's a sense of joy that I'm living a life that's true for me. So that's the healthy king. The shadowy versions of the, of the healthy king, when you don't believe that you're enough, will be you become a tyrant where you try to hold power over other people. So you try to prove to the world, I am enough. I'll show you how enough I am. And there's kind of this power battle, which I would say is a lot of the political uh, 
world mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when people talk about toxic masculinity I think that's like that, the, yeah and that's what you're looking at is tyrant king um, it's 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 not true masculinity it's not mature masculinity it's it's a different thing it's trying to hold power over others or you have the other expression so if you don't believe you're enough you have two ways you can respond again you can desperately try and prove by having power over others or you can say you're right I'm not enough and you kind of give up so that's the weakling king so that's our first one, the king, uh, vision, purpose. That's that's my um, my sense of direction in life. And a, a key tenant for the king is that when I'm in my healthy king, I can bless other men and I can say, you're doing a great job. There's not a sense of competitiveness because I recognize you're doing magic in the world. He's doing magic, she's doing magic. I can see the beauty in other people because I've accepted the beauty in myself. Whereas when I haven't accepted that, and I don't feel I'm enough, life's a competition. Then you've got your warrior. So it's great having a vision, great having uh, an idea of where you're going, but your warrior is the protector. So if you think about a, a kingdom, the warrior is the one that keeps out the bad guys. Um, so in our own lives, the healthy warrior is about protection. It's clean anger. So the expression of clean anger, sometimes men are afraid of their anger because they've been taught that it's wrong to be angry. But angry is what, anger is what allows me to say, no, that's not okay with me, or to put boundaries in place or to even take action and get pissed off enough to create change, like any change that happens in the world is a result of anger, typically, protests. and um, But sometimes the, the warrior is, uh, again, shadowy. We don't have that sense of um, uh, wanting to protect, we want to destroy. So that's when a man becomes uh, the overworker, like he becomes obsessed by, just completely driven by his warrior tendencies, always in a state of doing. That's a real common pattern. Mm -hmm. doing 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 i only find value when i'm achieving and doing things so they're caught up in that or there can be the opposite which is um uh the people pleaser or the nice guy where we have a sense of oh, well i'm a nice guy i should get all the things i want in life but there's a manipulation that comes with that because i'm telling you what you want to hear i'm not mm -hmm. expressing myself authentically so that's the warrior so king vision warrior takes action on the vision magician is kind of the um the part of us that can find perspective and challenge things and create transformation in our lives. So when we come up against fears, uh, our magician is the part of us that can take a step back and say, okay, where did this come from? And can maybe like the chapters of life uh, exercise I shared earlier, that's kind of magician work, like shaman work, uh, coming to the edges. Uh, uh, it, the, the magician works at a different pace uh, to the other parts. The world is very fast, but the magician's able to step back and kind of say, where am I going? Uh, sometimes in its shadowy forms it can be quite manipulative mm -hmm. and then finally the lover so if the king the warrior the magician are kind of very future focused if we live in those archetypes and we don't express our lover we can find ourselves always trying to get somewhere else not enjoying the journey so the lover is all about connection uh, connection to myself connection to other people connection to nature the the, the emotion that associated with the lover is grief and the idea is that if i don't allow myself to feel my grief i become numb to all of my emotions and i struggle then to feel i struggle to connect i struggle to um experience the moments in life and the shadowy forms of the lover are the addict so the addict is the man that's completely overran by his feelings he's just desperate to feel something and maybe his wound is he doesn't think he knows how to love and so he might go to a substance or an addictive behavior and try to seek connection through that rather than trying to open himself up to someone else. And the opposite to the addict then is the impotent, which is when a man's kind of feeling flat and empty in life and, and lacking, um, lacking, lacking umph, umph, if you will, yeah. technical term. So these are the archetypes. Um, king is the leader in your life. Warrior is the action taker. Lover is the sense of connection. And magician is the problem solver. Oh, that's so fascinating. Do that, does that work that you do with men's circles, does that really land for them? As in, can you very clearly see out? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Or so, does it sometimes feel? It's, it's like it's a lifetime of work to understand those archetypes. There is so much in it, you know. Um, but I think some guys, it really clicks. They're just like, wow. Particularly the warrior and the lover. These are two that are kind of in contrast. Like that's your kind of, if you were to think archetypically of, the warrior is maybe the London-based banker who's just achieve, 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 like do, 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 do. And maybe then think about the lover as being an artist who never finishes a piece because he's just got no structure. So there's one that's very flowy. The artist is very flowy, but lacks structure and discipline in its extreme. Uh, lacks boundaries. It's just very go with the flow, moseying through life. And then the person who's very much in the warrior is always trying to get somewhere, always trying to achieve. And there's a kind of 
balance between those two. It's like, can I have structure and discipline in my life, but also have freedom and flow? So I think that's the one that a lot of guys will relate to. Yeah. But you asked uh, earlier about where a guy is struggling. The four wounds, the wound of the king is I'm not enough. So at some point we picked up the belief that we're not enough. The wound of the lover is I don't know how to love or I'm not lovable. So again, that will be a belief that was picked up early. The wound of the warrior is I don't exist. So that's the idea that if I'm not doing, I don't exist. Okay. Yeah, that I that I don't well that I don't matter. That I'm enmeshed with other people. That uh, I'm not a, a strong sovereign individual in the world. Um, and again, there's two responses to that. I either kind of give up and become the people pleaser, so I don't express my needs in any way. Or I really relentlessly try to prove that I do exist. Those are the the responses. And finally, the the wound of the magician is is shame based. It's I'm bad. I'm inherently bad in some way. And so my thinking parts will try to come up with strategies throughout my life to hide my badness, mm -hmm. to hide the parts of me I don't want you to see. So again, I I become these different parts. So you don't see the parts that I'm afraid that you'll reject me for. That's a lot of work for people. To we we have lots of issues. <laughs> I mean, trust, seriously, so do we. So, I, and to be honest, I relate to a lot of those things myself. I think that the piece around the not not feeling enough is just a very universal and human one. But I would say that men, going to generalize massively, mm. but hide it a bit better, or it might not be as obvious to us that men feel that way and maybe it's as superficial as the fact that men you know are strong and they present themselves as whatever successful what they how they want to move through the world and so when we meet them we would never think that man doesn't feel enough does that make sense mm. unless it's actually said and i think the tricky part is actually because of so so much around what men feel is masculine is not to show that vulnerability. And that is the the piece around connection for, between men and women is that actually when they do, it softens everything. Mm. And it's, I'd be curious to know, it's like a final piece for our conversation, your thoughts around, and it's not something I like to give a huge amount of um, energy to because I think it's got, you know, it's got a lot of negativity around it, but the sort of Andrew Tate, movement of today with someone like that and for those that don't know he's sort of a deeply misogynistic character that has created a huge online following and I just even though people you know he's been in a lot of trouble recently and stuff you just think what is going on that that what's happening to create a following do you know what I mean like why mm. what's the wounding that's drawing people to someone like him what does he represent that's facilitating some kind of mm. giving them purpose. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. So what are your thoughts on that? It's the father wound. So there's um, the idea of traditional initiation for boys. Are you familiar with this kind of idea that um, traditionally in most societies or most uh, tribes or uh, there, there would have been an initiation once a boy got to a certain age, so boys thir 12, 13, 14, within the tribe or within the village, they'd notice there's something changing here. This like there's an energy in him. So in the West, we say, oh, he's hormonal or he's he's been a pain in the ass or whatever. But in the village, they'd say, oh, there's something shifting here as he's coming into puberty. And up to that point, he'd spend a lot of his life with his mum. So he'd be largely influenced by his mum and maybe female teachers in school if, if they had schooling there. Um, but once he comes to his initiation, all of the men in the village would dress up and face paint and stuff. And they'd come in and they'd snatch the boy from his mother's arms in the middle of the night. And the mother would be in on it. So she'd start crying and don't take my boy and don't take my boy. And the boy would be brought out into the wilderness. And it was different. There was different initiations for different, you know, areas. Sometimes they'd have to walk around and survive for months, go and walk about for months. Sometimes they'd have to hunt and kill an animal. Uh, sometimes they'd have their teeth knocked out. So there was always pain involved. There was confrontation involved with difficulty. There was meeting difficult emotions involved. Um, but there was also the support of your elders, so the men within the village. Your father typically wouldn't take you out to initiation because the there was the energy was too close. There was kind of a there would always be a bit of tension there. But your uncles, your granddads, other men within the tribe. But anyway, what this was about was killing the boy so you could become a man. Because um, biologically, girls have a clearer yeah. change. Uh, and so for boys, this was about 
the boy going out, tackling his salah, what we've talked about today, going into his wound and recognizing his goal, recognizing the, the messages and the lessons in his wound, being supported by elder men. Um, and then he comes back and he serves the tribe. The initiation wasn't for him. The initiation was under the recognition that if boys don't turn to men, then the village burns to the ground because you don't have people stepping up and stepping into their roles and going past their insecurities and their fears and actually serving humanity. With the industrial revolution and things changing then, men went to work in factories and there was no longer men in the village. And so boys now were raised by women in the household and then mostly uh, female uh, teachers in school, I would say. And so there was a lack of, a lot of us will have got the worst of our fathers. You know, fathers doing their best again in a sometimes sick society to go out and make money and like balance all their pressures and struggles. But maybe dad's tired and he's stressed when he comes home. And for young men, I think the thing that they want is the blessing of older men mm -hmm. because you're confused and you don't know what's going on in the world. You just want an older man to say you're doing good. You're doing OK. Um, that's what's led, I think, to boys feeling lost and just craving something like someone show me a way uh, to be in this world and to show up in the world. So I think the men's groups are a step in the right direction, like bringing men together. Um, there's some initiations now being done for younger men. So hopefully that becomes a bigger thing. Um, but it's the father wound. It's it's the blessing of. What it comes down to, I think, is if I believe I'm not enough, my life will be a competition and I'll compete against other men and I want to win and I want them to lose. And so I can't bless them and say that they're beautiful and that they're, they're doing a great job. And so now they live in fear. I live in fear. We all live in fear. So rather than supporting one another, we're competing with one another. So if we can learn to see each other's goals, which starts with seeing our own goals, I think that's when everything starts to change. Yeah, that's really powerful. Well, Pat, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I enjoyed it. You're a calming influence, Keggy. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> yeah, apparently I do have a calming influence. But anyway, thank you very much. My pleasure. For coming on the Saturn Returns podcast and for sharing your wisdom. I found it tremendously useful myself. So I'm sure our audience will too. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Saturn Returns. I hope you found it useful and if you did I would love it if you could share it with a friend because that is really how we've grown as a podcast and I'm so so proud of this community and all of you guys for your support so thank you so so much and a big thank you to Pat for joining me on this week's episode as always remember you are not alone goodbye <laughs>